Hi everyone, I'm Dick Deming, Medical Director of Mercy Wine Cancer Center and founder of Above and Beyond Cancer. Welcome to our Cancer Education Series. It is a joint production with Above and Beyond Cancer and Mercy Cancer Center, and it is provided with support from the Iowa Cancer Consortium. So welcome tonight and to our guest, Julie Larson. And Julie, welcome. Thank you. So Julie and I got to know each other a few years ago when she came to Iowa. Julie's originally from Indiana, high school in Indiana, and got her undergrad degree at Miami of Ohio, and then went to the Big Apple and got her graduate <laughs> degree at Columbia University in yeah. New York City, has a master's of social work. And we got to know each other because when she moved to Iowa, we connected because she's done a lot of work around uh, counseling and support services for individuals that are on a cancer journey, both uh, patients and uh, young adults and caregivers. And I just was so excited to have her in the community. And uh, so welcome, Julie. Well, thanks. It's nice to be here. I appreciate you inviting me. I'm always happy to be here. And a very important topic. I mean, it really is the topic that makes cancer survivorship an important issue and the reason that we have um, individuals that are involved with mental health and counseling. It's not cancer survivorship isn't just about doing an x-ray and proving that we can't see any cancer. Uh, the reason mm -hmm. that cancer has such a toll um, emotionally and even philosophically is because there's never a test that absolutely guarantees your cancer is cured. Uh, so so mm -hmm. yeah, what we're going to talk about tonight is yeah. the fear of recurrence. And I don't know anyone who has been through the cancer journey that doesn't have um, in somewhere a seed of doubt or fear. Sure. Yep. The moment you hear those words, I have cancer, um, I think that begins the journey of how will I be safe, right? And how will I be okay? Certainly in that active treatment phase of working with your medical team, but then beyond that, how do I know? How can I trust? How can I trust those around me? How can I trust myself? How do I begin to befriend and, and grow this, repair this relationship with my body? Mm -hmm. You know, just in that brief introduction, you um, identified what, what I would say three phases which with different emotional um, characteristics. Right. One is being told you have cancer and it's like, I'm going to die. You know, death it's a is a scramble. In the room. I think, you know, for anybody that's had cancer, I'm, I'm looking at our audience here too. I want to make that eye contact out there. But, you know, I'm just thinking, you know, that initial phase is a scramble, right? And it's filled with questions and you're thrown into that. And, and then you get into treatment. And I think a lot of people kind of hit the groove of like, just following directions, yeah. right? I just got to get day to day to day. And how do I feel the best I can on Monday, Tuesday, up until that next treatment? And emotionally, everyone's different. Every journey is different. But what I see, you get in the group of treatment is finally after weeks of tests and planning and you get that first treatment, and it's finally we're doing something. And so there's this a bit of an emotional safe space where we're we're treating the cancer and then you're done with cancer treatment and it's like holy buckets i sure hope it worked because and i think what? there's a there's a sense that we we work toward that getting done with treatment right there's even some places where people ring a bell or they do those celebratory things and that sense that you made it and 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 yet for a survivor everything falls away the team falls away, the consistency of support falls away, and you're left alone and often in that moment beginning to recognize, whoa, how has this really hit me? And, and maybe even those around me are celebrating and not quite in sync anymore with where I am. And I mm -hmm. think that that's a very unsettled place. And we, we may not do the best job in the cancer community of it preparing people for that. I, that's, a, that's a very good point. I, I'm a little... Um, uncertain about the best way to mark that end of the treatment. You know, uh, yes, there's a celebration. It is a milestone. It's yes, a yes. and it's a threshold you yes. cross. But sometimes, you know, 
too many balloons and confetti uh, for, can be a little bit of um, a false sense of hope that, or, or like, I'm not sure I want to celebrate just yet. Let's it's just more complex market than that, more, right? com more yeah. complex. Um, and I know I, we, you, you have a bit of a presentation, so we're going to do. do this, Julie. Um, and we've got a live studio audience, and we've got a live uh, virtual audience. And also, Julie, this is being um, recorded as a video podcast and will be on demand for people beginning tomorrow. Oh, but tonight, um, we're going to do it as a bit of a conversation and presentation. So we're going to switch over to the slides so that uh, here in our live studio audience, you'll be able to see the slides projected. Those of you who are attending uh, virtually or watching this on demand will see the slides. And uh, Julie, I'll turn it over to you for the presentation, but I'll probably interrupt and we'll that. have a conversation yeah, as we go along. I love that. I mean, we continue to talk and I'll look at you and I'll look at you and I'll try to slip my time. Um, fear of recurrence. And you can go ahead and move on to the, the first slide. Um, I think we just touched on this, but that initial statement of you have cancer brings just a flood of questions, a flood of thoughts, a flood of emotions from information overload. Suddenly you're thrown into like your doctorate degree that you never asked to have. Um, uncertainty about commitments, whether that's to work or to school, to family the emotional weight of conversations with the people you love. Like, how do I talk about this? How do I talk about it with children? How do I talk about it with work? Um, fear about the future and questions about the long-term impact of the treatment that you're getting, right? So not only are we beginning to think about, gosh, I have cancer, but also we're gonna now do all these treatments and, and how is that gonna feel? I'm gonna scoot a little closer. Hi. Hi. How are you doing? Good. You're going to be on the same screen. <laughs> Get a little closer. <laughs> you can go to the next slide. Um, and I don't know if that sounds familiar. I see some nodding heads in all of you, and certainly my career has been in this. So that is where a lot of this information for me is generated. We talked about the complexity of balloons and confetti at the end of treatment, and and I think that's because. There's so much weight to that. There's also a de degree of wanting to celebrate. But I think when I sit in my office, um, what becomes abundantly clear is there's grief. And I don't know if that resonates with all of you or with those listening, but there's grief in this. There's a lot of loss. And, and you're talking, Julie, grief at the end of treatment? Is I think there's grief from the beginning. Yeah. And you may not oh, yeah. recognize it or call it as such until later mm -hmm. in the game. And part of it, you're, you're grieving the things you're missing out on. Yeah. And, um, you know, I, okay, I got to go to cancer treatment. We've just had to cancel this vacation. Mm -hmm. We can't uh, leave town this next weekend to go to the wedding that we were going to go to. Uh, my counts are down. I can't go to the ball game, you know. Yeah. So there is a grieving of that. Um, but I picked up on it because there also is a bit of this... Um, this grief when you're done with treatment. And I, I relay it, relate it a bit like uh, you, you've trained all year for doing a marathon. You've just run your marathon. It's over with. And it's like, okay, what do I do tomorrow? Yeah. Like, do I commit to something different? Um, I've got this, you know, postpartum blues, if you will. What, I think that focusing. also implies that many people feel quite connected to their treatment team, right? They've gotten quite a bit of support and they've formed relationships with their favorite chemo nurses and they know those people. And suddenly that family that has surrounded you isn't with you. And that is really hard to navigate and to justify. I think the other piece of grief that I refer to and certainly shows up in my therapy office is the dawning awareness that I've changed. 100% a cancer diagnosis changes you. And it takes time to figure out how. And so, you know, I think that that also, that piece of kind of like what, I'm not the same, I, I want to get back to normal, but I can't go back. This is different now. I'm different. I'm changed. And I'm not quite exactly sure what that what that looks like or how that is. And I don't know how to navigate that. And that's a bit confusing. I have, you know, the stages of grief here. 
if you know, if anybody knows about the stages of Elizabeth Kubler-Ross and denial, anger, bargaining, sadness, acceptance. But what that might translate into is denial. I don't like to think about what's changed my life. So ignore it, distract myself, push it out of my head. Like I'm just saying, like, I'm going on, I'm on, back, I'm good, I'm totally fine. And that's kind of like, yeah, there's stuff that's changed, right? There is where you can't just avoid that anger. This sucks. This isn't fair. Everybody else is doing these things. Why me? All of that anger, bargaining. I am sure that I will feel better after the scan. Just when I get to the scan, or once my hair grows back, then, 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 that's when it's gonna start to feel normal again. Or when I don't feel this pain, or when I've lost this weight, or when I finally get that mastectomy, mastectomy bra, that's when I suddenly, I think that that's when I'll adjust. And I think that that's bargaining. That's that stage of like, mm, there's change here and we're bargaining. And then sadness is just a very vulnerable place of being honest. And then acceptance isn't rainbows and unicorns, as we know, right? Mm -hmm. But acceptance is this, is, this is where I am. This is who I am. And um, I have good days and I have bad days and upset times and not upset times. And, mm -hmm. it, and I would agree that part of the acceptance is <clears throat> understanding that we all have bumps. And I am glad that I have gotten with support through this bump, but it's not the last bump in my road of life. Yeah. Even even if the cancer doesn't come back, it's not the bump, last bump. Things fall apart and they come back together and they will fall apart again. If you ever thought you're going to have this nice, easy, flat path from now until you drop over dead, number one, that would be such a boring existence. Well, and I'd then, also worry about you clinically. And, and, number, <laughs> and number two, it's not reality. Yeah, I'd be like, mm. Oh, so things will fall there. apart and i'm glad <laughs> yeah. we're put you you're all put back together again but guess what there's gonna be there's gonna be a bump there's gonna be a bump and i think or... acceptance is also letting go of the fight so i say a lot yeah. in my office and this comes up in later slides too a lot in my office of let's have a self-compassion check right and a reality check and can you we all to click collectively lower our expectations <laughs> Can you take it down a notch? You know, is that okay? Yeah. And, and, and another way of looking at it, which takes a long time, but it's, you know, centuries old philosophy is how do I accept things the way they are rather yeah. than just wanting or hoping or praying that things will be different than they're going to be. Yeah, that's a hard thing to do. That's, a, that's, that's the sadness. Then I think we bounce back to sadness mm -hmm. maybe. Okay. And the hope and the acceptance is that the way I behave today can change the way I feel. Yeah. I have control over today. I have the power through my own uh, thoughts and acceptance of, of changing the way I feel today. Yeah. My thoughts today may not change whether the cancer comes back next year, but it changes today. So you are speaking straight into my slides. Okay. So we can keep moving. Yeah, because because I think that that is what we talk about a lot. And people are like, yeah, but how? Like, could you give me a manual on that? Could you give me some strategies and some tricks? And that's a lot of what happens in my office is why do we address that? What, what does changing the way I look at something or addressing that really mean? So I can let you go through. So I mentioned before reality check. Um, this is, this is a, this is, this is a strategy. This is what I would give you this, you know, as a homework, as a, as a something to take is that if you recognize you're in a moment of struggle, like I'm not feeling my best, I'm not feeling great. I wake up and I feel a little, bleh, little yuck. Um, what would it be like to just take a moment and do a reality check? Let's put all of it on the table. Let me first just say that this is horrible. You've got cancer and now for God's sakes, you got homework too. Oh, I give people homework oh all the time. God. If you don't, if you don't want home, yeah, you know. I coming to yeah, I give people there. I I have my clients have a notebook <laughs> at school. No yeah. notebook. Like I want you to like think about what we talk about. Do some things. Recognize these things between our sessions because you want to grow and build these muscles. It's the mental gym, right? So, um, reality check. Let's put it all on the okay, table. Okay, back to the homework. So, here. what's going on in your life? Right. You you've just finished cancer treatment. You've got, I don't know, kids at home, or you've got, you know, groceries to pay for. You've got to get back to your job. You've got to get, you've got to navigate this X, Y, and Z. You've got a really tricky cousin over here that's a stressor in your family. All put all of it on the table, right? In addition with yourself, let's go ahead and put your biology and your genetics on the table, right? You've lived how many years in this skin? 
So, you know, some of us have a tendency, we're, we're hardwired for worry. <laughs> I tend to be a worrier. Mm, I come by that naturally. Put that on the table. You didn't ask for that. You didn't sign up for your genes. You didn't sign up for that, but it's on the table. I tend to be somebody that compares or catastrophizes. Okay, let's put that on the table. And then you just begin to see, okay, a lot of what is on my plate, I didn't ask for. I didn't sign up for this. No wonder I'm feeling heavy. No wonder I'm stirring. No wonder this is hard for me today. That's the beginning of that self-compassion of like, well, yeah, of course I don't feel so great. Look at all the things that I'm dealing with. And just even in that moment, we begin to be a little lighter with ourselves. So then I'll have you move on to that next slide. It's a reality check. And so then this is your second piece of that reality check is could I say to my clients, I say, whenever I speak, could everyone walk away from this with a charge to cultivate a habit of checking in with yourself? Just how am I doing? How am I doing? I'm feeling a little irritable. I'm feeling pretty impatient right now. Okay, I'm feeling restless. I'm feeling unsettled in my stomach. I am feeling um, sadness. I'm feeling doubt. Maybe I'm feeling really content and grateful and blessed and calm. Just how do we begin to pay attention to ourselves? I think we live in a world that goes very fast and we get really kind of focused on what we're doing and we lose sight of how we're doing. So just every so often, you know, I do it when I'm cooking in my kitchen. How am I doing? Okay, I'm feeling kind of pressured. I've got a lot to get done. Or, you know, how am I doing as I wake up? I'm feeling a little... Um, irritable. There's a lot of noise in my house. <laughs> Whatever it might be, right? What, how do you do it? Because, next slide, when you begin to cultivate that, that habit, you can begin to also ask yourself, what am I doing in this moment? I guess this is the last slide. What am I doing this moment that's helpful? And what am I maybe doing that's not working so well for me? Okay, so I am caught in my social media scroll. I'm just scrolling and scrolling and scrolling. Julie, let me ask you a question. So um, there's there's thinking and there's feeling. So help us understand when you do this check. Uh, what am I feeling? Yes. Yeah. So if you want to, magical slide master, <laughs> you can fast forward. Go click forward. I'm going to tell you when to stop. Go. Yep. Stop. Nope. Back. So your there we go. self, you see, you're, yeah, yeah, I got you right here. Mm -hmm. I'm right with you. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. <laughs> it's like we have a secret. Um, but we all think, feel, and do, right? And often the thoughts in our head are driving, or the movies, or the narratives in our mind are driving the way that we feel. And then that in turn impacts the choices that we make. We withdraw, we constrict, we get silent, we, we pull back. Are we overcompensate? You know, so whatever we do. So, so what I, one of the things as I get to know my clients, and I would, I would challenge you to kind of just sit in this audience today and just kind of think about yourself, is I ask people, how do you first recognize your stress? And I've over the years, so I've been in private practice for 17 years, and I would say that over time I would begin to, I would say that there are those who notice their stress first in their ruminating, spinning thinking, right? And they sit in my office and they tell me, I think this, and I think that once this happens, and I'm thinking this, and that I think, and I think, and then I know this is going to go down, and then this, and I think, and I think, and I think, and I think. Mm -hmm. Right, and they're they're so head. They're the elevators on the top floor, yeah. and, just and they're busy, 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 busy brain. And when I ask them as a therapist, you know that magical therapist question, <laughs> well, how does that make you feel? <laughs> because that's what I get paid to do. That's what they teach us in grad school. <laughs> uh, uh, how, I, how, I can <laughs> tell you what I'm thinking, but how do I know what I'm feeling? And in my thinkers, so my thinkers. I'm feeling uncomfortable that you're asking me this question. Okay, so you're feeling uncomfortable. Did you just trust? But I actually, in my office, have a framed feeling world because people have a hard time oh, with their right. feeling vocabulary. And so they, we have a very... A handful of feeling words that we use all the time, but there's 
hundreds of feeling words, right? So I sometimes just give people the feeling words. Is this, is this going to help you? My thinkers often, when I say to them, how does that make you feel? They might say to me, well, I think, <laughs> and they bounce right back to what they're thinking, right? But if you think, if you're listening to this and you're thinking, yeah, I'm a thinker, then your challenge then is to begin to get in touch with what you're feeling, what that feeling is, because we, we, we care for, we tend to our feelings in different ways. We do something very different with impatience than we do with dread or um, isol feeling lonely, right? So, so those are different things. Now, my feelers in my office, boy, there's a lot of emotion all over the room. There's tears and there's agitation and they're like, I just feel like I don't know and I'm lost and I'm confused and I'm concerned and I'm worried and I feel left out and I don't know and I feel I feel mad and I feel angry. And I say to my feelers, well, when, what, do you, what do you tell me? Help me to understand a little bit what you're thinking that might be making you feel this way. And that, for if you're a feeler, so if you're somebody that your feelings are right there on the surface for you, those tears come early, you feel pretty intensely, then I would challenge you to sit with that a bit and begin to pay attention to what that narrative is. What's the, what's the picture you're painting? What's the, what's the story that's driving that feeling? Because a lot of times our thoughts get into traps mm -hmm. that that aren't exactly accurate. And if they're distorted, well, then our feelings also distorted. So, so I have a question for you about that, you know, chicken and the egg and, and the relationship between feeling and thinking. So um, I wonder whether it is automatically true that the thinking precedes the feelings or whether feelings can um, affect the thoughts. I mean, an obvious you fall down, you break your leg, you've got an intense feeling right then and there that's going yeah. to affect your thinking. And arguably your thinking didn't yeah. make the pain in the leg. So, so I think the, they all happen at the same time. And okay. that feeling that you're talking about is mm -hmm. a different, so that, if you go back to my slide, that's, not that's an emotion, your body. That's a body, yeah. And that's another group of people in my mm -hmm. office. So I have those people in my office, and they are in a ball uh -huh. on the couch. And they're telling you their heart rate and their They're uh, really their not body. speaking too much. Not, okay. <laughs> <laughs> they're like, just like looking at me. Okay. And they're tense, and they're withdrawn, mm -hmm. and they're closed up. And I'm like, you know, I can see all of that. And I'm not sure if maybe that person has some degree of awareness of what they're feeling, but they certainly feel it in their body, right? So there are others who feel, or when I ask again the question, how do you first notice your stress? Some people notice it in their spin of their thinking. Some people notice it because they're they're very emotional. They're feeling their fragility of emotion, right? And some people notice I wake and I got a gut punch in my in my stomach and I got tension in my shoulders and I feel inordinately fatigued and it doesn't really make sense. Or I feel like kind of nauseous. So some people notice their stress mm -hmm. first in their physicality, and then we can still tie it to, okay, well, what might you be thinking about? And then what, what is that then making you feel? And now how can we begin to care for that and, and also care for your body? So you're right. It does, does interact. And yeah, in, in other medical conditions, you can think of things like a hyperthyroidism where you're, you're just, your heart is racing. And then that causes you to have uh, emotions that come mm -hmm. from the, the physiology of what's happening. So yeah. sometimes well, in the physiology, one of those I love that. I'm kind of nerdy that way. I really kind of like the science of it, you know, because, you know, we think of mental health as a soft science. My master's is in science, right? And we think of it as a soft science, but there is science in this, right? When you get stressed, whether that stress is I have cancer, mm -hmm. your limbic system back here in your brain fires up. And that is all of that adrenaline and cortisol and all of that floods your system. So one of the main ways of calming is contending to yourself is to begin to kick in your parasympathetic nervous system and calm all of that down. Mm -hmm. You know, and everybody recognizes that sympathetic. I mean, you, you are uh, outside and a dog jumps out of a bush and scared. You instantly feel the physiology. Yeah. I mean, your yeah. mouth goes dry. You feel your heart racing and pounding and you feel that physiology. 
the dog didn't touch you. It's just this. And at the same time that that happened, whether you're aware of it or not, your thought was, I'm going to get attacked and I feel fear. Mm -hmm. So they all happen together. And that is so obvious. I would say that the, the parasympathetic isn't as obvious and immediate. Mm -hmm. It's there, it, but it takes a little bit of more cultivation for us to you know, appreciate, appreciate the physiology that happens in our body when someone we care for gives us a hug. Yes. Ju the, the same, the opposite reaction happens, but it's not as wham, bam, I feel it. Mm -hmm. It takes a little bit more uh, introspection. To it's the rest and repair. Yeah. So it's the completion of the stress cycle, right? So your stress gets triggered. You go into fight, flight, freeze, fawn, whatever you do, right? And that's here. That's the fight. And then the parasympathetic is the rest and repair. That's when you begin to calm. And we have to do that. And oftentimes we don't get there. I'll have you fast forward again on my slides. We can click forward. I'll keep going. One more or maybe two. There. Okay. So this is the what you're talking about. So, you know, I think in our culture... America, Western, we are a fix it society, right? We are a dig in, fix it, problem solve it, strategize it, analyze it, process it, talk about it for days, <laughs> right? Like let's, people come to therapy because they're going to just talk about the feelings, right? And they're going to gain insight and awareness. And we're going to know where all this comes from, my mom and my attachment and all of this, right? We're, this is just kind of how we do our mm -hmm. world, right? And, and you're either going to be part of the solution or you're part of the problem. Or you're going to gain some insight that suddenly is a light bulb and you're suddenly going to have this deep understanding of yourself, right? But Oftentimes, step one isn't insight driven. And in fact, sometimes when we begin to process and think and think and think, we're going to stir the pot. We're going to further fuel the anxiousness and the thing. So step one is often get calm. You got to get calm. And the, fat, the, the most powerful way to find calm. So again, let's go back to you and your, your life. And you feel like, okay, I'm having a moment of struggle, right? We've done the self-compassion check. Well, no wonder I feel this way. Like, look at everything that's going on in my life. Step one is not to figure out why I feel this way. Not to figure out, oh, I have a tendency to do that. Whatever. No, this is happening. Don't stop. Step one, get calm. And your most powerful tool to get there is your body. And Good. I was hoping you would have solutions other than this pill, this drink, or this hit. <laughs> yeah. You do have some better I solutions. Do. Those yeah. are some numbing strategies. <laughs> but, um, but, um, but I think that, you know, getting calm and getting, finding our just kind of like ease. When you feel calm, if your body's calm, your mind's calm, and we not only feel better, but we act smarter, right? When your limbic system is on fire, your prefrontal cortex is offline. And if I can define what that means. And that's not a good sign. No, not, because, not a good time to hit send on an email. No, because and you know what's in your prefrontal cortex. But for all of us who don't know what's living up there in this part of your brain, it's where your impulse control lives. It's where your judgment lives. It's where your decision making lives. It's where your language lives. It's where everything lives up here. So when you're on fire, when you're feeling stressed and you're feeling activated and that is showing up in either like nervousness, fear, worry, just frozen, then this is offline. So we've got to get a little calm first to get that back online. And then you can begin to make some smart decisions about how to care for yourself. How do we get calm? How do we do that? Okay. So there's a number of different strategies, right? Um, you've heard a lot of these in different ways. I use, I said, use your body. Your body is in the present. Oftentimes our mind is living in our perceived future or our past, right? And that's crowding out our present. So we need to come back to the here and now. Your body is here. A couple things I tell people are to, when you feel that way, is to use your five senses, right? That's your body. So can you name from five, four, three, two, one? Can you name in this moment five things that you see? So I see the microphone. I see the scrap of paper. I see the table. I see the cords. C is pretty easy, right? Four things you hear. I hear the buzz of the room. I hear my foot on the ground moving. Do you see how that requires a bit more attention? 
three things you feel. I feel my feet on the ground. I feel the chair underneath my, my um, seat. I feel my heart beating. Two things that you smell, one thing that you taste. As you go down that list, your attention has to get more and more focused on your body, right? And I often think of attention in, when I work with not anybody, but a lot of times I, I work with teens and young adults a lot too. And so I say, you know, let's use this metaphor of our thinking about your attention as a flashlight. And so if your attention, your flashlight is on that scan or on that pain that you feel in your shoulder, which daggone it is the same place that you felt a pain when you first were diagnosed and all of your story in your brain is that I've got a recurrence and now I have cancer, it's metastasized to my bone. Okay, if your attention is on that story, well then how are you gonna feel? You're gonna feel unsettled, you're gonna feel agitated. We're gonna take that flashlight and we're gonna turn that flashlight to your body. We're gonna go through five, four, three, two, one. Another strategy of body is, um, do you know about square breathing? Square breathing is great. So sometimes a lot of people say, take deep breaths. And that feels kind of abstract. I mean, I mean, we get it, take a deep breath, but are we doing it the right way? Is it really calming me? What, how do I do that? Can you give me something to kind of, I'm feeling anxious right now. I don't know, <sighs> that's not working. So if you think of a drawing a square in the sky or drawing the square in front of you, and each side of the square has, is a four counts, okay? And when you go up the side, that's your inhale. So inhale for four. Hold, two, three, four. Exhale for four. Hold, two, three, four. And that will give you a little scaffolding around your breathing. And especially if you're feeling kind of spinny or you're feeling a little, you know, dissociated. Dissociated is when we kind of fly off and we're not connected or, or feeling really present. So if you're feeling that way, then that gives you a little bit of scaffolding to hold on to and also gives you those long, good, slow breaths, which is going to begin to trigger mm -hmm. that parasympathetic nervous system, which is going to slow your heart rate, calm you down. Do you feel it in the room even just now that we did the five, four, three, two, one? right? You can feel that just begin to slowly change the pace. And then when you're back online or you're feeling a little calmer, then we can maybe return to what just happened? Did I just get triggered by something? Oh gosh, I was just watching the Super Bowl and that ad for that cancer drug came on and ugh, that took it out of me, you know? are, you know, the date on the, I realized that the temperature in the air is kind of that same gray and that same temperature of those days when I wasn't feeling well that led me to the doctor that led to my diagnosis. And now I get it. That's what's going on for me, you know? So then we can begin to look a little closer at what's going on and that softens it a bit. Good. Yeah. I definitely calm me down. Yeah. Calm but that's, home. so, so be yeah. Here, be here now. Yeah, I like the be present. Yeah, and then we can get our mind back on track. So that's your body. But people often talk to me about, yeah, but those thoughts still hang out there. So I'm going to skip around in my slides again. Let's see. Let's go forward. More. More. Again. <laughs> there. Oh, it's not. Oh, it shows up in a different way. So it's. I hope you can see it. On my screen, you can see it. I'll read it to you. Don't worry. So um, facing off with worry. So a lot of times your worry shows up, a, um, tell me if you're with me or if this resonates, but a lot, I think a lot of times wor for people, worry shows out of, up in what if questions. What if, what if this is cancer? What if um, I can't, I'm going to have to go back into chemotherapy? What if I lose my hair again? What if, you know, I can't go to this event? What if, what if, what if, what if, what if, what if? And how do we respond to those what ifs? And there's a couple different strategies to that that can kind of be grounding and give you some concrete plan around that. So can you change your what if into what is? Take it away from what if and what is. What is is black and white, concrete evidence. Well, my last scan showed no evidence of disease. Um, I recognize my hair is growing back, so that's a sign of healing and growth. I do, um, I know that I've got this doctor's appointment on the calendar. My CA 125 is in a good place right now. My, you know, like where, how do you begin to take the black and white information that you have and have that help you find evidence against your what ifs, like play lawyer with it a bit. 
and you might make a list of that. You might, might write those things down. I don't know if that one, if you have that no. in your office. Um, you know, I'm not using that particular strategy, but he, exactly right. I, actually, today I was having a conversation uh, with uh, an individual who um, is on a journey with incurable cancer, is doing well. Uh, we were actually up at the state house lobbying for a bill to, uh, mm -hmm. for, for radon in school. And, and, uh, she, she said to the legislator, you know, I'm not sure, doc, tell me what's my prognosis, you know, in front of the, le and I said, um, and, and, you know, it's not a cop out, but nobody knows for sure. And with the current medication that kind of is keeping things under control, it's like, um, you know, uh, the best prediction of tomorrow is yesterday and that I predict that tomorrow you'll be feeling as good tomorrow as you felt to feel mm -hmm. today. And um, the question isn't how many days are you going to live, but how are you going to live today? Yeah. And so it's a, a bit about here's the facts. You feel great today. You're on the medicine. You're here. Mm -hmm. The overwhelming odds is tomorrow. That's the way you're going to feel. Yeah. And, and tomorrow, and you know, that makes me think of another strategy that I use when you just say tomorrow, um, because a lot of our worry is about tomorrow, or it can be ruminating about the past. Like I should have done this. I should have gotten to the doctor earlier. I should have said something sooner. I should have, I should have, you know, that past, we can kind of get lost there. We can kind of work. I sometimes say to my clients, can you also begin to look at your thoughts and bucket them, put them in buckets of that thought is a past thought. That is a future thought. That is a present thought. So, so just kind of put them, separate them, organize them, compartmentalize them. And then can you leave your future thoughts to your future self? I say that to my client. Can we leave that one to your future self? Do you think we can? We, I hear you. I think it's very important. I don't want to minimize that concern. I, I can understand why you feel that fear and that uncertainty. I don't know that there's anything we can do about it today. Can we just put that on over here for your future self? Can we trust that to the efficacy of your future self? And I think that that is helpful sometimes because it means that I'm not forgetting it. I'm not dismissing it. I'm not ignoring it, mm -hmm. but I'm just going to give it on up to my future self. You know, what strategy I use, and it's right, it's being present, like right here, right, right now, today, the patient I was talking to, we have everything we need this moment for perfect joy. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean that we don't reflect on yesterday as when it's appropriate to see what was there about yesterday that I can learn, lessons mm -hmm. learned. Mm -hmm. And it's not that we don't sit down sometimes and figure out, strategize, how do I get to where I want to be? I mean, that's good. Yeah. But, but to worry and constantly replay the thoughts of yesterday and the what ifs of tomorrow. Another strategy that I have is that you say, these reflection and planning are important, but you don't need to do it all the time. Yes. And so maybe at 10 o'clock in the morning, okay. you give yourself 15 schedule minutes it. and you schedule it. And yep. for 15 minutes, you're going to give you worrying about or thinking about the past. What could I have done yep. differently? You're going to plan it and you're going to plan 15 minutes to strategize. But the rest of the day, just be present. It comes to your mind, go, no. I've got an appointment with you tomorrow at yes. 10 o'clock. Let, let's do Schedule it. Schedule it out. I think that's a really great, that's an excellent strategy. Beautiful Schedule saying that worry. you, I don't know who said it, but I just love to repeat it. I first heard it in the locker room of the YMCA. It's a, okay. the twin thieves of happiness. Hmm. The twin thieves of happiness are regrets of yesterday and worrying about tomorrow. Hmm. Those steal happiness present. from present. Happiness is a tricky feeling. I think happiness and contentment and joy. I don't know if you know that phrase, um, foreboding joy. You guys know the phrase no, foreboding joy? I don't know foreboding joy. Foreboding joy. I don't know how many people in the audience have a children, but I can think of it with that. When you look over the crib at this precious, amazing child that you love, and it's so scary. <laughs> Gotcha. Right. Like I feel so, and you can feel it in a moment of after mm. cancer treatment. And I feel so good in this moment. The other shoe's going to drop. Mm. Mm. 
this is too good. This is so, I am so blessed. I am so happy right now. I feel calm and at ease and therefore something's going to change. That's foreboding joy. Yeah. And and it's and it, I think it's it's it makes joy kind of one of the hardest feelings to have because it's got this shadow on the other side of it. And one of the easiest ways or not easy, but one of those, you know, antidotes to that is gratitude. And you know, how do you lean into joy through gratitude? You know, like what are you thankful for in this moment? And that can kind of lead you back to your present. And um, just to get back kind of the main theme mm -hmm. of yep. managing fear of recurrence, um, what other and other uh, specific homework assignments besides the idea of, okay, 10 o'clock tomorrow, I'm going to yep. get myself So you're scheduling out your minutes. worry. You're giving it to your future self. Mm -hmm. We're turning our what ifs into what is. We're using our body to get grounded and calm before we begin to process. Okay, we'll go back to that slide with the yellow words that we can't There read. we go. But um, another option is to turn your what if into what else. Okay, so I feel this pain in my shoulder, and I'm worried that that's bone um, metastasis or something shifting in my in my treatment, or something's going on there. What else could it be? Are there other possible truths? So I say to my clients, could there be another truth? And the reason I say that is because what you're the narrative in your head feels very very true, right? So let's not ignore or argue that that is a possible truth. Is there another truth? Oh, we'll come to think of it. I was really gardening the other day, or I had a lot of bags and I was carrying that could also be it. Um, I didn't sleep well at all last night. I think that I'm feeling unrested and my body is feeling that today. Could we begin to color in the lines and our color in the picture? Could there be other reasons why this is happening? You know, I, you know, what if, you know, none of my friends are wanting to reach out to me anymore. I was gone. I was in treatment for so long and I've lost all of my connections and I call people. Nobody invites me or nobody else wants to do anything with me anymore. And I, I lost all of my friends. What else? Could they not know that you're feeling more up to socializing now and that you're open to those calls and maybe they don't realize that you're, you're seeking their, their friendship and their connection again. So could there be more truths to this thought that is playing in your head? Could there be maybe some more scenarios? Another one is what if to then, to what, to then what? So and this makes me think of, I've worked with a, a man for quite some time. He was not a survivor. Actually, his wife, had a diagnosis of breast cancer, but he really struggled with his own anxiety around her diagnosis. And he <laughs> came into my office after a week of not, we had a session the week and then he came back and he said, listen, I am trying to do your what if to what is situation. And I am trying to, but that doesn't work for me. Like it just doesn't work. Like I can't, I, my head just keeps going there. And I'm like, well, how did you get through the week? Like, how, how are you? What did you do instead? He's like, well, I just went down the worst case scenario. I just took the train, took the train of terribles. And for some people, that can be really calming. So what if, well, then what? Okay, so you get a recurrence, then what? Okay, you start talking to your team about the next treatment options. Don't fall off a cliff. You start talking to your team about the next treatment options. And then what? And then what? And, then, and sometimes if we just go there, and we begin to get a concrete plan, a window into what would happen. Then two things happen. One, you kind of feel like, well, I could do that, or I don't want to do that, but I could. And that is so far away from where I am right now. The, the obvious of the disconnect of where I am right now and that what then what is becomes so highlighted that then it kind of helps you to get back into your present. So for some people, they find it really settling to just walk down their worst case scenario. Just go, then what? Well, then what would happen? And then what would happen? Because often it's, there is a plan or there is something mm -hmm. there. I, I've worked with a lot of people who have advanced stage cancer or, you know, or metastatic stage four breast cancer. What if, I, and then that, that fear of, will this line of treatment stop working? Mm -hmm. And then there's going to be progression and then, and that's going to be, well, then what? We do the next one. On to the next one. We look at the clinical trials. We begin to see what they're, you know, begin, when you begin to recognize, oh, I don't just, I'm not just abandoned. No. We look, begin to look at the next step. Then what? And then the, the, the final piece, and this again takes you, takes that flashlight of attention. What if to what else? Okay, I see you. Worry. I hear you. You're in the room. Gotcha. But what else? 
oh, well, later today I've actually got a meeting with some friends and, and then I've got to make dinner and I've got to go to the grocery store. I mean, can we turn your attention just away from that? That's living there. Can it linger in the background? Can you begin to cultivate some degree of tolerance for distress kind of hanging in the background while your attention can kind of stay focused on what's right in front of you? You know, one thought I have, and I'm not sure where it fits in, but it's sort of understanding that um, in other things, maybe not cancer, but we've, we've been down this path before. Let's say, I mean, the first time you get in front of a, a group of people to speak and it's just unbearable, but with practice, you learn how to do it. Or first time you're driving and the idea that you're going to go 60 miles an hour on a four lane with other cars is just unimaginable, but we do it. Yeah. And that um, you've been through this before, you've learned a lot, you can do it again if you need to. Well, and I, I have a client right now who is going back on treatment. She's ovarian cancer and she has had a recurrence and that's upsetting. That's hard, right? And part of our work is reminding her, we are, she is not where she was when she was first diagnosed. She knows how to navigate this system. She knows how to care for herself in a different way this time. She knows who's available to her for support. She knows what it looks, this is different. This, is a di this isn't that same place. And there's a lot to kind of reconcile with this place. But I think reminding yourself, you're never going back to that initial hit. You know something more about your body. You know something more about how you communicate with your team. And that is mm -hmm. a really important thing to hold on to. You're different. I think one of the points I was going to make, and I, I kind of lost track, is that the what is the relative risk and how do we put it in perspective? So um, people, um, I mean, back to driving on the freeway, you are, it's, you, the risk of driving on the freeway when you're virtually in is like, oh my God, how does anybody live through this? And after a few years, you don't even think about the risk of driving on the freeway. I mean, we drive without, um, I mean, there is risk. You, you can't get in an accident. It really does exist. Most of us drive without much thought of the risk that is truly there. And the same with the risk of a recurrence for individuals who who, who understand the odds. Our, our fear isn't always based on the statistics. And we learn to accept many, many risks in life. And it takes a while before you learn to accept that, yes, this could happen, but the likelihood is not tremendous. And if I spent so much time worrying on things that are unlikely to happen, I could never get anything mm -hmm. done in life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I feel like I've had so much conversation around that, and I have it phrased for it, 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 around COVID. I've done so many talks over the past three years around COVID, around especially the cancer survivor audiences and nationally, you know, how do we navigate through this, especially as immunocompromised population? How do you do, handle the feeling complication and awkwardness in other relationships, your own fears and anxiety? And one of the things I often say to that point is, is your worry in the speed limit? Is it in the speed limit for this situation? If you're feeling extreme concern and worry because you're going to connect with one person on a patio, how is that worry? There's worry there, right? There's worry there. There could be worry there, there right? Risk. But is that in the, how are you, is that worry manifesting within you within the speed limit for the circumstance? Mm. And how do you begin to think about that, right? And because we, because the word safe, and that implies, you know, even after treatment, the word safe implies absolute and nothing Nothing is absolute. We want to tie it all down. We want to button it all up. We want to put it in a nice little neat bento box. You have finished your cancer treatment and we can't, mm -hmm. we can't. And so we are always dealing with some degree of mystery and unknown and uncertainty. And how do we keep that within the speed limit? Yes. How do we keep it commensurate, commensurate and proportional to the, the real risk? So in some ways, knowledge can be very helpful 
knowing, you know, what was your state, what was your risk. But in all honesty, I mean, it's a double-edged coin because some people, hopefully it will give them great deal of confidence and um, sense of reassurance. Mm -hmm. But for some, if your risk of recurrence based on all of the facts is 50%, it may not yeah. give you the sense of, of, of um, comfort. As a, as a doc, um, I want folks to have the facts, but I also like to accentuate the positive mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, without giving any false hope. Mm -hmm. I, I'm one who believes at the very beginning, if a patient has incurable cancer based on the treatments we have now, that I actually call that out and, and say, this is very treatable it's not curable yep. because the choices you make in your treatment are very different if you've got 20% chance of cure, but we're going to just beat the crap out of you for six months with the hope that we really do versus yep. no, this is treatable, not curable. The goal is to just keep it under control without causing you a lot of additional. But But how do you... And how do I, as a doc, mm -hmm. for that, you know, 10% or less accentuate the positive. Your your chances of it coming back is slim. When do I back off accentuating the facts without providing false hope or um, misconstruing the facts? Yeah, I think there's a lot, you know, and you do this too. You know, there's there are different cancers not created equal. Right. All diagnoses are not the same and people respond in different ways. So there's, and the way in which people respond is very different too. And there's a trajectory to that. I'm going to go back to grief, right? Grief has a period where you, we have a phase of grieving this and understanding ourselves. My four o'clock session today was a woman with stage, I don't know, stage one, maybe even, maybe could even be stage even, zero, maybe even stage zero breast cancer. And she was wrought with worry and um, she can make whatever choice feels appropriate to her. And she's 37 and she chose both a double mastectomy and a medical hysterectomy, the whole nine, everything. And it was, came to me because the anxiety was really spinning for her. And we, she's much, she's getting, she's in a much different place now. But one of the things that I worked with her on in a strategy too is can you envision all the voices in your head at the risk of making you sound like you have multiple personalities, which you don't, <laughs> but um, can you envision all of the voices in your head as the board meeting of yourself? Mm. Right. And you, your favorite self, I'm going to resist saying your best self because I don't want to qualify it as good or bad. Right. But your favorite self is the executive self, right? And good old worry self stands up and points out all these risks and all these things and all this. And, you know, as your executive said, thank you so much for your contributions. That is important for us to remember and to pay attention to. I appreciate all of putting all of that on the table. You may be seated. We're um, anxious self is like, we're going to stay inside forever because we're immunocompromised and we're never going to go out into the world because we're going to be at risk for all of these different diseases. And that could really shorten our lifespan. Thank you so much, worry self, for watching out for us keeping us safe. Maybe seated. So how do you value? And, and can we have a glass half full? Can you speak up? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thank you for that. You know, so, so there's all these different voices that are speaking up, right? And they have value. They have a purpose. They have a meaning, but you've got to find that executive part in you. And so today mm -hmm. she talked to me about, she was feeling pain in her back and that triggers her worry. And she started to go on a spin. And at one point she just said, stop. I don't want this. This is not how I'm doing the day. And I was like, I love that you talked back to the worry bully in the room. <laughs> like he's bullying you. Tell him to sit down. It, maybe it was a girl. I don't know. I don't mean to be gendered. But like, you know, like, bully sit down in the room. And so, you know, how we begin to recognize those different voices and take back our own control too. So Julie, our hour is up and we yeah, have not get through all the slides. We haven't gotten to the questions. Uh, I, there's only one solution and that's you're coming back for, for another.
sure. for another yeah. hour. Yeah. So this <laughs> has been wonderful. Thank you uh, for being here tonight. And um, so we have a live studio audience. Please stay around. We might be able to chat a little bit, but we've got to sign off because I have to teach spin class. Oh, we have spin, spin class, class coming up. Yeah. So <laughs> thanks everyone for attending. Uh, for those of you who enjoyed this and want to watch it again, beginning tomorrow, it'll be uh, available on demand at the Above and Beyond Cancer YouTube channel or at the Mercy One Cancer Center website. So please share the information with others that you think might appreciate this. Uh, thanks for attending and we hope to see you all next week. Thanks a lot.